All right, we're going in three, two, one. Good morning. My name is Pete Baklinski. I'm the communications director for Campaign Life Coalition. Tomorrow, Canadians from across the country will march for life. They'll start from Parliament Building and they'll march through Ottawa's downtown core. They're marching to protest the 1969 abortion law that decriminalized abortion under then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Prior to this, abortion had been criminal. It was considered a homicide, the intentional killing of a preborn child. But in 1969, which will always go down as Canada's day of infamy, a law was passed that allowed a woman to kill her preborn child under certain conditions. There needed to be a therapeutic abortion committee of three doctors that uh, existed in select hospitals. In 1988, the Supreme Court of Canada, in this building right behind me, threw out that law as unconstitutional. Why? Because they deemed that it infringed upon a woman's right to security of person. That's because a therapeutic committee of doctors in select hospitals did not exist across Canada in various geographical locations. It was hard to find such a committee. It was hard to find such a hospital. And so they threw out that law as unconstitutional. The Supreme Court of Canada did not establish a right to abortion, nor is there such a right in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms actually states that everyone has the right to life. Because the Supreme Court of Canada did not establish any right to abortion, it, all, it actually tasked Parliament with coming up with a law that would balance the interest of protecting the life of the child, balancing that against the woman's rights. The Supreme Court said that the state has a legitimate interest to protect the life of the child. And it said Parliament should come up with such a law. That never happened. And to this day, abortion exists in a legal vacuum. That means that there is no protection for preborn children in the womb and abortions can be committed through all nine months of pregnancy. Many people hold the mantra that it's a woman's choice, it's a woman's body but it's a widely constitutionally accepted principle that autonomy ends when harm, when harm can be brought to another person. It's time for our governments to recognize that the pre-born are human, that they have their own bodies which are separate from the bodies of the mother, and that abortion harms them. The theme for tomorrow's National March for Life is I am. The theme speaks about the existence of life in the womb, the unique, unrepeatable existence of an unborn child. The child's existence in a mother's womb practically screams, I exist. At five weeks, the baby has her own heartbeat. At 10 weeks, the baby's brain waves can be discerned. At 12 weeks, the baby has arms, legs, fingers, toes, and even her own unique fingerprints. We march on Parliament Hill tomorrow because that is where a just law should be created that gives legal protection to children in the womb from the moment of conception onward. Justice to preborn children demands that we recognize their humanity and we protect them as full members of the human family. The leaked U.S. Supreme Court document 
on Roe v. Wade has made the abortion issue suddenly explode here in Canada. Politicians, including our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, have released misinformation about abortion in Canada and its status. I will now turn to my colleague, Josie Lutke, spokeswoman and youth coordinator for Campaign Life Coalition, who will explain some of the abortion misinformation that is circulating now in Canada in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court leak. Thank you, Josie. Thanks, Pete. So Justin Trudeau has indicated that he is looking to enshrine a so-called right to abortion to increase access to this procedure. Last week, he tweeted, the right to choose is a woman's right and a woman's right alone. Every woman in Canada has a right to a safe and legal abortion. We'll never back down from protecting and promoting women's rights in Canada and around the world. It is a fact that a new human organism is created at fertilization. It is a fact that abortion kills an innocent human being. So there is no right to abortion. There cannot be a right to abortion. There is no right to deprive another human being of their most fundamental human right, the right to life, without which all our other rights would be meaningless. In addition, there is no such thing as a safe abortion. The purpose of abortion is to kill an innocent human being. If you don't end up with a dead fetus at the end of the procedure, the abortion has been unsuccessful. It has failed. So to call an abortion safe is a, it's, it's laughable. In addition, it makes a mockery of human rights to call abortion, the taking of an innocent human life, a right. It is antithetical to human rights. So when Justin Trudeau says that he wants to, that he, he pledges will never back down from protecting and promoting women's rights in Canada and around the world. I hope that's true. I agree with him. I think that's great. But abortion is not a woman's right. And to, no one has a right to kill another innocent human being, but to assign that as a special privilege to women is an insult. As a woman, I can say that I, I'm insulted that he thinks that the capacity to bear life, to bring life into this world, is something to be degraded. And that, something, that, that killing an innocent human being is something to be celebrated. So we are going to be rallying on Parliament Hill tomorrow. We will be marching through the streets of Ottawa to demand legal protection for all human life from conception to natural death. We are demanding an end to abortion. We stand in opposition to Justin Trudeau's attempts to promote abortion across the world. It is not only an injustice here in Canada, but it is barbaric that he wants to convince other peoples, other nations, to kill their progeny, to kill what brings them life. And so we are going to be returning here in Ottawa every year until this human rights injustice is ended. We expect for Roe v. Wade to eventually be overturned, and that will be one step towards abolishing abortion in the United States, and then eventually around the whole world, including here in Canada. And we pledge to be a part of this effort to end this human rights injustice, not only for the sake of the, the four million preborn lives that have been lost since 1969, 100,000 more are added every year to that total. We pledge for their lives, of course, but also for the men and women who are post-abortive, who are in pain because they bought the lie that in order to be free, they need to kill their offspring. And we also make this pledge to restore meaning to the term human rights. Thank you very much, Josie. We'll now turn to our Director of Political Operation, Jack Fonseca. He will speak about the further implications of the leaked Roe v. Wade decision in the United States, and he will also speak about the ongoing conservative leadership race. So I've introduced Jack Fonseca. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so a question on uh, many minds is uh, how, if at all, does the uh, overturning of Roe versus Wade, which we hope will happen, very shortly. How does that impact the law in Canada or the political situation in Canada? Uh, will it lead to a, uh, some kind of similar legal move in Canada? And we, we, we hope and we believe that this is indeed, the overturning of Roe versus Wade in the United States is indeed a fulcrum, a tipping point, uh, but it's a long-term impact where it will not lead to legal restoration of the rights of unborn children in Canada right away, but it will 
lead to that eventually over many years. The fact of the matter is we have, uh, before we can pass a law to protect, to restore legal protection for all, for all children, including children in the womb, um, we first have to get a majority of pro-life MPs in Parliament. And that still won't be enough. We have to get a majority of uh, senators who are pro-life and who respect uh, the true constitutional right to life as established in the Charter and in our Constitution. And then there has to be a majority of Supreme Court judges. And so that's, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But the overturning of Roe versus Wade will help us towards that goal because it enables, it will enable Canadians uh, to have kitchen table conversations about the humanity of the unborn child, about the right to life, and why is the Canadian situation, the Canadian legal situation, so vastly different from what we see with our friends and neighbors just to the south of us, where half the country um, will be expected to, to make abortion completely or nearly completely illegal. And why is there such a vastly different uh, legal situation in terms of the protections afforded to children in the womb in Canada versus the United, United States, our, our closest neighbors. And so people will be more open to the pro-life message. They'll be more open to being educated about the humanity of the unborn child and the sanctity of human life. And hearts and minds will, will be changed much more rapidly and much more easily. And through that process, we will change this culture of death into a culture of life. And yes, that will take time, that will take hard work and commitment by pro-life people across Canada, by human rights defenders and advocates, by uh, spiritual leaders who are guided by their faith to respect the sanctity of human life as given by God, as, as uh, commanded by God for us all to protect and respect. Um, so that is how we'll eventually uh, get to, to a law in Canada. Um, I, I want to also comment, we, we've been asked a lot by reporters about uh, what impact this has on the leadership race, if any, in the Conservative Party of Canada. And uh, currently the situation is that uh, of the six verified candidates so far, and there is a seventh, Grant Abraham, who is still fighting to get on the ballot. He is a pro-life candidate. Uh, but uh, so far of the six, there is only one who is pro-life, uh, Dr. Leslin Lewis, the uh, Member of Parliament um, in Ontario. And uh, we fully support her. She has a green light rating from Campaign Life Coalition. She has uh, four simple pro-life policies in her platform, her No Hidden Agenda platform. One is uh, banning sex-selective abortions. And this is something that uh, a majority of Canadians in multiple polls over the years have said they support. It, it makes sense to them whether they identify as pro-life or pro-choice. Uh, banning sex-selective abortions is something that makes sense to them. It's a way of increasing respect for human life, so we applaud her for that pro-life policy. She uh, would also uh, bring forward a bill to protect women, pregnant women, from being coerced to abort. And this is a tragedy that happens with uh, bullying men, um, you know, husbands, uh, uh, boyfriends, etc., across Canada, where women are coerced against their will to abort their child, pressured, and they feel hemmed in by these pressures. So that's a, another common sense pro-life policy. Um, that she has on her platform. She will provide more support to uh, crisis pregnancy centers that provide all kinds of supports to uh, women and their unborn child in terms of diapers and baby food, financial support, uh, counseling, uh, guidance through their education plans, shelter. So this is again a very welcome uh, pro-life policy by Dr. Leslie Lewis that will be uh, uh, accepted by Canadians of all stripes, of all political stripes. And finally, she has pledged to uh, end Justin Trudeau's uh, funding of abortions in other countries with Canadian tax dollars, which is going on at the tune of 700 million taxpayer dollars per year to pay for abortions in other countries, as well as what they call sexual and reproductive health rights, which is activism related to abortion. And she's pledged to cancel that uh, wasteful and ideologically motivated spending by the Trudeau Liberals. Um, I want to also comment, um, it's been mentioned by my colleagues that uh, Justin Trudeau has vowed to bring in, or to, to bring in a law to codify abortion on demand in Canadian law. Abortion on demand, and we know from his past views, his past statements on abortion, that he is an abortion extremist. And this law, we expect, 
will codify in law abortion on demand throughout all nine months of pregnancy up to the moment of birth for any reason or no reason at all and it will also protect sex selective abortions misogynistic abortions and uh, as well as eugenic abortions that target uh, uh, children with disabilities so Canadians need to understand just how radical um, Justin Trudeau is in his abortionistic views and uh, in fact the reality is that the the law that Justin Trudeau has vowed to bring in will very likely be offside with even Canadians who identify as pro-choice uh, it will be too much for them and but I don't think Trudeau will be able to help himself he is an abortion absolutist he's a megalomaniac on this issue and on many other issues uh, so uh, w we believe that uh, it will actually turn off many Canadians um, when they understand just how extremist his, uh, his uh, law would be or his proposed bill. So we thank you very much. That's, uh, and I'll turn it back to uh, Pete Beklinski. Thanks very much, Jack. We'll now open up the floor for questions. We also have the availability of answering questions in French. We have two French speaking people with us. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please identify yourself and what news organization you're representing. And uh, the floor is open. Any questions? Yeah, well, th that's why the, uh, the the overturning of Roe versus Wade is so important for 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 Canada, because it will make Canadians more open to to the pro-life message, seeing that there is protection for children in the womb, just to the south of us in the United States. It is expected that 26 states uh, in the U.S. are ready as soon as over, uh, Roe versus Wade is overturned to uh, completely or nearly completely criminalize abortion. About a dozen states have trigger laws that are ready to do that. So there will be a dramatic culture change in the United States, and that culture change will uh, spill over into Canada to the benefit of uh, unborn children who have the right to life, inherent to their being huma humans. And, uh, and, and there will be kitchen table conversations amongst Canadians about this issue, and they will be more receptive to the pro-life message, to being educated on the humanity of the unborn child than they ever were before. That is our belief, that is our hope. And uh, you know, in recent years, we've already seen a greening of the pro-life movement. Uh, prior to COVID, we had 30,000 Canadians come to march with us to protest in front of the steps of Parliament Hill, in front of the Prime Minister and our members of Parliament, demanding legal protection for children in the womb. And 80% of, of that uh, 30,000 were people under the age of 30, many teenagers and, and people of college age. So we're already seeing a greening of the pro-life movement, a blossoming of the pro-life movement, and the overturning of Roe versus Wade will greatly accelerate that process. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll turn that over to, uh, to someone else to, to handle. It's hard to say because we're just coming out of the uh, COVID uh, prohibitions on, on large gatherings. So, you know, I'm not sure uh, what impact that will have, if any. But uh, perhaps, Josie, would you like to address that? Sure, we're expecting around 3,000. Obviously, it's hard to know because of COVID and that has impacted our numbers. In the past, we've had up to 25,000 Canadians marching. So we'll have to see tomorrow. Um, sorry, what was the latter half of your question? Uh, were you expecting more because of uh, the news out of the US? Certainly, that definitely has motivated um, supporters to want to um, show their support for life. Um, I think that obviously, with, given the Canadian situation, it's very discouraging here. Um, but we have a lot of hope, um, obviously, with news from the states that, um, like Jack said, um, we'll see a culture shift here in Canada. And there's a lot of people who want to be a part of that. So definitely, I think they're motivated to come out. Yeah, it's okay. We have a question in French. Uh, Georges Vichemi, our representative, uh, will be happy to answer your question. And if you want, maybe I'll just bring the mic and you can ask so everyone can hear the question. Okay. Bonjour. 
que non. Est-ce que vous pouvez pas se tromper de faire un point de presse comme ça devant la Cour suprême du Canada alors qu'il n'y a pas de cause devant la Cour actuellement? La, le statut légal n'est pas menacé au Canada en ce moment de, de l'avortement. Il n'y a pas de projet de loi au Parlement non plus. Vous pouvez pas se euh, tromper de, de, de faire ça ici ce matin de, 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 devant la Cour? Hein? Bien, c'est un lieu où a été décidé, en fait, euh, la dépéni dépénalisation complète de l'avortement en 1988 avec l'arrêt Morgenthaler. Donc, puisqu'on parle de l'avortement et, et du fait qu'il qu y a un, un, un néant au niveau des lois au Canada, c'est évidemment ici qu'on devrait en parler parce que c'est ici que ça a été décidé. Alors, en 69, il y a eu la légalisation de l'avortement avec euh, pierre Elliott Trudeau, puis en 1988, avec l'arrêt Morgenthaler, euh, toutes ces lois, les balises ont tombé, qui, qui, a, qui permet l'avortement de la conception jusqu'à l'accouchement. Donc, c'est ici que ça a été fait. Bien, une vague, ça commence avec euh, un, les plaques tectoniques sous-marines qui, 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 qui font une fissure. Et là, on a vu une brèche, exactement avec euh, l'arrêt Roe vs. Wade qui a été renversé ou qui va être renversé, on l'espère. C'est cette craque très profonde qui, qui nous permet d'espérer qu'il va y avoir des remous encore plus forts à l'avenir. Alors, ça va avoir des retentissements culturels sur toute la planète. Spécialement au Canada, on est juste à côté des États-Unis. Euh, C'est un pays de grande influence internationale culturelle. Alors, quand on verra des États, comme mon collègue Jack avait, avait mentionné, des États qui, du jour au lendemain, euh, avec euh, le renversement de Roe vs. Wade, euh, mettent en place des lois pour protéger les enfants à naître euh, dans plusieurs États, les gens vont commencer à se demander, et pourquoi pas nous? Qu'est-ce qui, qu qui fait pour que... Euh, si on traverse une frontière, tout à coup, euh, les enfants à naître dans le ventre de leur mère sont des êtres humains, puis quand cette personne-là change de place, ça n'a pas de sens. Alors, ils vont commencer à réfléchir sur le fait que peut-être que nos lois ici sont inadéquates, peut-être qu'on n'a pas suffisamment réfléchi à notre affaire. Et donc, euh, c'est ce mouvement culturel que nous voyons, euh, que nous envisageons. Bien, je suis déçu qu'il y ait eu ce genre de, de rejet de deux candidats qui semblent avoir euh, accompli tout, tout ce qu'on leur a demandé de faire, l'argent, puis les signatures. Donc, il y a quelque chose d'un peu obscur là-dedans qui nous euh, inquiète et, et, et que nous déplorons, ce manque de transparence dans le processus de, de, de nomination de candidature. Alors, ceci, ceci étant dit, euh, un candidat... Euh, quand, quand la barre est très haute, quand, quand la mise de fonds, c'est 300 000 c'est quand même pas rien. Euh, nous trouvons ça quand même admirable. Ça veut dire qu'au moins, euh, si c'était représentatif de la population, c'est un sur six Canadiens à peu près qui, qui seraient en faveur de, de cela. Les, les, les minorités agissantes sont celles qui décident de l'avenir d'un pays. Puis je, je crois vraiment que le, le mouvement pro-vie, le mouvement qui reconnaît l'humanité de l'enfant à naître, est est une telle minorité agissante qui peut changer la donne pour le pays en entier. Pour trop longtemps, on a eu cette minorité, je dirais, agissante pro-avortement qui a pris les commandes et qui a fait en sorte que, que notre pays soit, euh, je dirais, absolutiste en faveur de l'avortement. Et là, c'est le temps que ça change avec euh, Roe v. Wade qui a été renversé. Et si on lit la décision, elle est très intéressante sur le plan juridique et historique. On voit que les 50 dernières années ont été comme une parenthèse anormale dans l'histoire juridique occidentale. Alors maintenant, on revient à la normalité, on dirait. On sort de la grande noirceur des 50 dernières années et j'espère que nous allons commencer à voir des changements qui, qui, euh, positifs en faveur de l'enfant naître. Um, you know, after Roe versus Wade in the states, some states are now talking about banning contraception, like the pill, uh, in their states. Is that something that Campaign Life Coalition also supports, making contraceptions illegal? Well, that's not something we're focusing on. We're focused on uh, on abortions. Um, there are many forms of abortion that are happening. Uh, 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 
uh, surgical abortions which uh, dismember children, decapitate children, uh, chemical abortions, and um, so that's the issue that we're focused on, not on contraception. So uh, it's really not an issue that we're dealing with. Well, it, it is going to be popping up in federal debate around the Pharmacare program. There, there's talk about having free contraception as a part of that. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that plan, but then also in terms of a law moving forward that you would like to see, you say it's going to take a long time, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. are you pleased with putting limits on abortions or do you just want, is your only goal to try and ban them throughout Canada? Uh, we, we believe that uh, the human rights of, of uh, human beings ought to be protected for all members of that human family and that includes children in the womb. So we take, as a pro-life organization, we take a personhood approach to the law. So we want a law that restores protection to every member of the human family from conception to natural death, full stop. So that's the type of law we're working towards. In the meantime, uh, we'll support efforts to, uh, uh, to ban sex selective abortions, things like that, that, uh, that provide some measure of, of increased respect for the sanctity of human life. And, and, and by the way, I should mention that those types of uh, pro-life policies, modest pro-life policies that Leslie and Lewis has put forward will help conservatives win elections because it is something that bridges the gap between uh, liberal voters and conservative voters and everyone in between that they will look at it and say, these are common sense policies, I agree with it, and this person has integrity, this party has integrity, I'm going to vote for them. Blair, uh, Prophet from the Ottawa Citizen. Uh, I guess my colleague mentioned the Reiche polls, uh, which show that 8 in 10 Canadians were in favor of abortion. I was just wondering if you could respond to that, whether you feel like you're still against the stream of, uh, of legislation on, on this. Why don't we let Josie? Yeah, sure. Josie, we'd like to respond to that about abortion polls. Uh, certainly, the majority of Canadians identify as pro-choice. Um, we are aware that we are in the minority. Um, that doesn't mean we're wrong. The majority has been wrong many times in the past. Um, and as Jack was alluding to, there are actually a lot of policies that the majority of Canadians do support, for instance, banning sex selective abortions. Um, also, the majority of Canadians aren't aware that there are no restrictions on abortion in Canada. They, the majority of people do think that there's some restrictions on abortion. So when you actually talk to them about the issue, you find out that there's actually a lot more common ground than we believe there to be. So I, I, I really think that actually we have more in common um, with the average member like of uh, the Canadian public than our current Liberal government does. And a second, uh, that follow up? Yep. Well, a second question would be that, uh, uh, I mean, are you looking for a blanket ban? Would you make an exception for cases of rape or incest or ectopic pregnancies where the Some mother's life is at risk? Mm. Uh, yes, we are looking for a blanket ban um, because it doesn't matter who your father is. It doesn't matter the circumstances surrounding your conception. You are absolutely deserving of the right to life. And I have every compassion for a woman in a crisis pregnancy, especially one who conceived via rape. That is awful. I hate that I have to address your question. I hate that there, there are circumstances like that that do exist. But ultimately, having an abortion is not going to unrape that woman. It's not going to um, erase her child. It's just going to make her the mother of a dead child. So then in addition to the trauma of the rape, she has to deal with the trauma of having killed her own offspring. So we're not going to make, uh, we, don't, we don't stand for exceptions for rape, and we're certainly not going to stand for any exceptions, be it for disability or what have you, because those are equal members of our human family, and either we all equally have human rights, or the, the whole concept of human rights is completely debunked. And, and if the mother's life is at risk through an ectopic pregnancy or some other um, so first of all, obviously those circumstances do exist. They're very rare. Um, with an ectopic pregnancy, there is a way to save the mother's life that will likely result in the death of her child, but we would not consider that an abortion as long as it's not, as it's not the direct and intentional means of saving the mother's life, killing the child. So uh, again, certainly as pro-lifers, we believe equally in the mother's right to life and the child's right to life. So we believe doctors should do whatever they can to preserve both lives in the rare circumstances where that's not possible. Um, we believe that in taking means of saving the mother's life as long as it's not through the direct and intentional killing of that child. Josie, can I just follow up to that too? I don't know if you're aware of the Dublin Decla Declaration where a thousand doctors uh, came together and decided uh, through their own expertise that abortion was never necessary to save the life of the mother. That Dublin Declaration was also backed by 3,000, sorry, 30,000 doctors in the United States that also signed a document saying that abortion is never medically necessary to save the life of the woman. When a woman is in a crisis with a health issue, there are two patients. There's the mother and there's the child. And
and in a pro-life society, the doctor works to save both of them. So um, we definitely uh, recognize that there are two lives here that, that need to be saved and protected. And with the ad advancement of medical technology, it's entirely possible to even operate uh, on a pregnant woman, even the child in the womb, to operate on that child and save his or her life. Uh, so we're no longer in a situation where it's an either or situation. Because of advancements of medical technology, it's possible to save both lives and doctors around the world have affirmed this. Uh, any, uh, any other questions? I have a question from CBC. Yeah, okay. CBC, okay. My name is Olivia Stefanovic. I'm wondering, would you support, um, do you believe men should be on the hook for child support, including pregnancy costs, uh, at the moment of conception? Anyone want to address that question? Jack or Josie? Child support, men on the hook for child support from the moment of conception. I, I can just say yeah, go ahead. You, you speak to that, sure. I believe that if men are sexually active, they need to be responsible for the offspring that they conceive, and they need to be there to support that, that woman if she conceives. For a man to abandon a woman that uh, he's conceived a child with is a terrible injustice against that woman and an injustice against his offspring, his child. And so what we need to teach men is to man up and to be the father that they are when they have conceived a child. And if that means supporting that child, uh, you know, with, with some kind of financial help, uh, ideally the man should be present in that, life, in that child's life, uh, supporting that woman, helping her to make the choice to choose life and then being in that child's life. And if a father is not able to do that, uh, he should definitely go in the direction of adoption where he knows that his child can have a life someplace else if he's not able to be there for that child. Last night we watched a wonderful film called Life Mark. It was the premiere in, in Canada here of this new film in the US about the joy and beauty of adoption. There was a mother who uh, her and her boyfriend is based on a true story, conceived a child in high school and she was about to have an abortion but something told her not to. Uh, the, the man wanted her to have that abortion, he paid for it, he sold his radio so that she could go have that abortion and he was mad at her uh, when she decided not to go through with that. He didn't respect her choice. Unfortunately, there are many men today who do not respect a woman's choice when she chooses life. And in this film, the child was eventually put up for adoption. And uh, when he became 18 years old, he actually tracked down his mother and his father. He thanked them for putting him up for adoption and giving him the gift of life. And uh, now he tours around the country telling about the joy and beauty of adoption. So if a man can't be there in the child's life, adoption is the answer. I think it's a moral requirement. Men should be responsible for their actions. If they have sex with a woman, they should be responsible for the children that they conceive. That's just on the order of nature, that's how it should go. Whether that's a law or not, men should be responsible for their offspring. And what exactly are the consequences you're looking for for abortion? Um, I really like what happened in our country with the pornography, uh, sorry, the prostitution law that came into effect where the Johns were criminalized. There was no criminal activity, uh, that w no criminal actions that could be brought against the woman. Um, if she was caught in an act of prostitution, it was the man who was uh, the charges were brought against. And that's how it currently is right now in our country. Uh, I believe that uh, it should be similar with abortion. Uh, the abortionists should be targeted. They're the ones who are actually assassinating the child. Uh, the woman, in many cases, is largely a victim who feels like she has no choice and is pressured into the abortion as the only solution. So I think we should criminalize abortionists because they're the ones actually doing the dirty deed. Um, you were, you've all been talking about a wave of support for the pro-life movement in Canada coming out of this Roe v. Wade decision. Is it not possible to have the opposite effect? Obviously, this has put pressure on the Liberal government to talk about abortion access in Canada. We're expecting is it not possible that this could have the opposite effect from the one that you're hoping for? Josie, you want to, Josie will address that. I mean, I certainly think that we're seeing a backlash, of course, um, from the pro-choice movement. Um, but I also think it really just 
relies on the strength of our arguments. And I think we have better arguments because I think it's very compelling um, to believe in the equal rights of all human beings. Um, as I said before, if, if we don't apply human rights to all human beings, we no longer have a concept of human rights. Um, looking around, like we're all very different. We differ in race, we differ in age, we differ in sex, we differ in abilities. Yet nonetheless, the majority of the public believe that we're all equal. Why are we equal when we're all so different? The answer is that there's some trait that we all share in common, and that trait is our humanity. It is categorical. You're either human or you're not. That is the source of our, of our value. And I think when people actually hear the pro-life arguments, they are persuaded by them. I think our, our, our main challenge right now is that we're not having this debate and people don't actually know what the pro-life argument is. So I think when people have the opportunity to hear why we believe what we believe, then the majority of the Canadian public will be swayed by our arguments. If I can just add something to that as well. Um, you know, the, the other uh, part of that, uh, you know, Josie explained very well that uh, it's a human rights issue and ending abortion, ending the killing of innocent human beings is the civil rights issue of our day. It's the human rights issue of our day. And I think people are going to recognize that, as she said, uh, the more that they have conversations, kitchen table conversations, conversations in their churches with their neighbors, etc. Uh, the other thing that is vastly different from the 1960s when uh, P uh, Justin Trudeau's father legalized the killing of children is back then there was not a window to the womb. The technology did not exist to see in the womb, to see the humanity of that unborn child. That is no longer the case. We now have uh, 4D ultrasound where you can see the baby sucking her thumb, where you can see uh, the baby swimming around and moving and, 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 and uh, things like that. We have uh, in utero videography and in utero photography where people can literally see. And that's part of the reason I believe why we are seeing a greening of the pro-life movement in Canada at the March for Life and elsewhere. Younger and younger people are joining the pro-life movement because they can just go online and see 4D ultrasound pictures. They can go on and say, that's not a clump of tissues. That's a baby with arms and legs and a mouth and ears and a nose. I know that's a human being. Don't lie to me and tell me that's a clump of, a clump of cells or, or uh, just a bunch of tissue. Uh, so I think we have science on our side. We have human rights on our side. And that's why pro-life will win the day. And in the end, um, legal protection for children will be restored in Canada. Thank you, Jack. Any other questions? So the topic has been debated and they're not willing to open it up again. Anyone want to address that? Josie? Thank you. It hasn't been. Um, I think if you listen at all to what's been coming from Parliament Hill, every single politician just says that this topic is not up for debate, the, the, the abortion debate is closed, that there is a, again, so-called right to abortion, um, which even the CBC recognized that, there, that the 1988 decision did not establish a right to abortion. So I think there, there was a lot of lies um, about the topic, but I don't think we've actually had a debate about it. Um, I think that we've done everything we can to avoid a debate on the topic. Um, and I, 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 I just want to reiterate that um, the pro-life arguments have been misrepresented as us just wanting to control women or whatever, and it's not about that, it's about human rights. Thank you, Josie. A follow-up? Anyone else for a question? Yes, that's what I believe. Um, he's been very clear in his uh, fanaticism on, uh, in support of killing children in utero. And um, it's, it's been, he's been asked about sex-selective abortion, for instance, and he defended it. Uh, he was given the opportunity to say, would you at least protect uh, uh, children who are being targeted just because they're baby girls? And he uh, defended that practice. So it is very clear that any law that's coming from, that may come from Justin Trudeau will be to codify in law abortion on demand up to the moment of birth throughout all nine months of pregnancy for any reason or no reason at all and fully funded by the taxpayer. And that is not something that Canadians by and large will agree with. Uh, Canadians will see that as radical extreme, totally disrespectful to human life. And um, I don't think uh, Trudeau is going to get the support that he, that he expects from such a law if he uh, proceeds with it. And I think there will be significant backlash against it uh, amongst values voters. Any other questions? Uh, what, what is your message to, to the conservative leadership candidates who don't support your view? And what do you plan to do about them if one of them wins? Right. Our message to conservative 
uh, candidates running in this race who think that the abortion debate uh, needs to be clamped down and that somehow speaking about abortion will lessen their odds of, of making a, a public sp splash. I want to tell them that the abortion debate is open and that preborn children in this country need legal protection. And this is the greatest human rights issue of our time. And if they want to be on the right side of history, they're going to back the preborn child and they're going to recognize that there is life in the womb and that, wo that life deserves protection and respect from conception onward. This is a winning issue. It's winning in the United States and it will win in Canada. If I can add something to that. Um, I, I think the pro-abortion candidates like uh, uh, Pierre Poiliev, uh, John Charest, Patrick Brown, um, they, um, uh, Scott Aitchison, uh, I think they are under the false impression, and, and part of it is because what they hear in the mainstream media themselves, that uh, if you show any support at all for, for uh, the sanctity of human life, that, that it's going to hurt you in the, in the election. And the evidence does not bear that out to be true. In fact, there is a lot of evidence to the contrary. And if we look at uh, Stephen Harper's government, the conservative government, who, uh, who had, uh, was in power for 10 years, um, he largely, I believe, uh, was successful in winning elections because he appealed to social conservatives, gave a voice to, to social conservatives and pro-life Canadians in his party, and uh, that was appealing to, to, uh, to a majority of Canadians. Um, and for, for instance, uh, leading up to uh, the first minority government that the uh, Conservative government had, uh, Harper appealed very strongly to uh, Christian voters when the Liberals were trying to redefine the traditional definition of marriage. And uh, they won a, uh, a minority. In that first minority, um, they, they came out uh, with a, a private member's bill, uh, Bill C-484, uh, the, um, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act. And Stephen Harper did not try to st uh, stomp that down. He allowed his pro-life members of parliament to bring forward such bills. And he was, uh, so there was uh, tremendous excitement and energy created amongst pro-life Canadians. Um, and, and that translated to support and religious voters. And uh, there's statistics that show that the Catholic vote uh, swi started switching over to the Conservative Party at that time. Uh, as you know, the Catholic Church is very much against abortion and believes it to be a sin and a crime against humanity. Um, then he won a, a stronger minority, the, the uh, Harper Conservatives. And in, during that second term, uh, even more pro-life private members bills came out. Uh, Rod Bernouge, uh, a Manitoba member of parliament, came out with the, uh, 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 a bill to ban um, uh, coercing, make it illegal to coerce a woman to have an abortion. Uh, the Conservative Party as a whole, the, the Conservative Caucus as a whole, came out very strongly uh, against awarding uh, Henry Morgenthaler the Order of Canada. And there was another pro-life bill in that term. What happened? Did it hurt him in the election? No. He was awarded with a majority. Then there was an interesting change. In, during that third term, Harper, for whatever reason, changed very, very dramatically, and he started to clamp down on the pro-life MPs. Stephen Woodworth, in that third term, came out with Motion 312 to form a committee to study what modern medical science says about when a child comes into existence, when a human life comes into existence. And Harper vocally came out against it, urged his MPs to stop it. Mark Warawa also came out with a, a motion against sex selective abortion, and Harper came out very strongly against it, tried to kill it. What was the result? The Liberals won the next election. So the evidence, I would say to the Conservative leadership contenders, don't believe uh, what you're hearing in the media, this narrative that somehow it's going to hurt you in the election, it's not true. The evidence does not bear it out. The evidence, in fact, bears out that if you appeal to values voters, if you appeal, appeal to religious voters and social conservatives with uh, modest policies that, that make common sense to the average Canadian, it helps you win elections. Thank you, Jack. All right, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this morning. Tomorrow is the National March for Life. We'll be gathering on the hill about noon and I encourage you all to come and cover the event. Thank you for uh, your time this morning. We're grateful for you coming out. Thank you very much. Can I feel you, Jeff? Yeah. The, uh, underwear mask? Oh, is that good? Yeah. I no you want to be in the shade? Cause yeah, yeah, I've been trying to hide That's behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're um, <laughs> 
L U E. Check out your name. P K E. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Um, sorry, what's your title? Um, I'm a co-use coordinator at Simply Mindful. And so you're a coordinator. Okay. Great. And what's your title? Uh, J O S I E. Communications Director.